righty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luisa Santa Coleman, and I'm the Education Director over at Healthy Women. We're very excited today to have two incredible um, health care or mental health providers, apologies, um, in our video about eczema and mental health. So with us, we have Dr. Herbert. Uh, Dr. Herbert is a tenured associate professor in the Division of Psychology and Behavioral Health at Children's National Hospital and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. Dr. Herbert joined the faculty at Children's National in 2013, where she is the Director of Psychology Research and Clinical Services for the Division of Allergy and Immunology. Welcome, Dr. Herbert. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, thank you. And then, of course, we have Dr. Lebovich, who is an attending psychologist in the Interdisciplinary Atopic Dermatitis Center at Boston Children's Hospital, where she provides consultation and support to children with atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema, and our caregivers. She has published on the role of comprehensive patient education and multidisciplinary care to enhance self-management and coping skills for patients with atopic dermatitis and has a particular interest in fostering children's, children's developmentally appropriate involvement in their own self-care. Dr. Lebovich has previously served on the Scientific Advisory Committee of the National Eczema Association. Welcome, Dr. Lebovich. We're very excited to have you as well. Thank you for inviting me. This is a passion of mine, so excited to be here with you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, we have a couple questions. So the first one, um, Dr. Herbert, we'll start with you. So does eczema affect both children and adults? And then the second part of that question is, how does it affect them differently, if at all? So we do know that eczema does affect both kids and adults. And um, from, from what I understand, it affects about 8 to 12% of kids in the U.S. and can affect like up to 7% of adults as well. And a lot of young children are diagnosed with eczema, and then for some of them, it resolves over time, but it is possible to be diagnosed with eczema later in adulthood as well. So this really is spanning um, the lifespan and is, and is affecting a lot of Americans um, and of course, if it's affecting children, that means it's also affecting their caregivers because caregivers are the ones who are, you know, working with medical professionals to understand treatments and then implementing those treatments at home. So it's really affecting a lot of people. Um, and we know that, you know, a lot of what um, happens with eczema is consistent across kids and adults as well. So having itch and having flares and then having an impact on different aspects of life is also um, going to be happening with both kids and adults too. It's just that they're in different settings. They have different developmental tasks that they're trying to accomplish as kids versus adults. So um, the direct impact of it might just be seen in different ways. Definitely. What about you, Dr. Lubovitch? Yes, well, so Dr. Herbert uh, covered a lot of really important po points really well. Um, I, I will add that when we think about atopic dermatitis, it's also nor important to keep in mind that for many patients, AD might be mild and might be more of a nuisance, something that is managed fairly easily. But a lot of the patients for whom we see the greatest burden on quality of life are, are those for whom it's more moderate to severe. Um, and so as Dr. Herbert mentioned, the burden in terms of itch can be really pretty significant. The itch can really impact um, children and adults' ability to concentrate, whether that be at school or at work, it can really impact sleep. We see that in terms of patient sleep, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, caregiver sleep as a result of that. Um, and so, and so all of these can then have a, an, an impact on, you know, mood and functioning during the day. So, so certainly it's a skin disease, but when people ask, you know, why is a psychologist involved in a clinic or treatment? It is because a, a, across the developmental spectrum, there is a significant uh, impact. 
Thank you for bringing that in as well, because I, I, I also, um, as I had mentioned uh, before, you know, I feel like there is quite a bit of information about atopic dermatitis um, specific to more perhaps the clinical component, but sometimes we forget that there's a mental health component as well and how it can affect your emotional well-being. And I'm glad that you also mentioned that you know, um, if it's a child with eczema, it doesn't just affect the child's sleep, it affects the caregiver's sleep as well, right? Because they're, they're there to help them in a system in whatever way possible they can. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, I'll kind of um, add to that, that when someone goes in for a medical appointment about eczema, they're told a treatment. And typically that treatment is something that's daily, right? So it is that you're using specific lotions, medications, like there are specific things that you should be doing every day to kind of prevent flares or to manage flares that do occur. And so once families get home, they have to figure out, well, how is it that I am implementing that into my daily routine? Like, is this something that now I need to allot extra time for in the morning before my child goes to daycare or to school or before I go to work if, if I'm an adult with eczema? Or at night, like what am I adding to that sleep routine? Am I adding in special baths? Am I adding in extra time again with these different types of treatments? And then how does that fit in during the day as well if my child or I need to, to be able to apply medications and things like that? So we kind of, um, when we think about mental health, we should be thinking about just that daily burden and like the stress that comes from having to adjust to doing all these things that many families don't have to even think about. That, that's a really great point. And I would jump in and I'm so glad you said that because the other piece is that so much of the care happens at home and so much of the decision making. So when we're thinking about care for atopic dermatitis, what you're doing when the skin is relatively clear um, is still very important, that baseline skin care. But when you're what you're doing when you or your child has a flare looks different. And so parents or patients themselves are often responsible for navigating, you know, what am I doing at different points depending on what the skin looks like. And so um, I think that really speaks to the piece around having a skincare plan that you understand. And if you don't, <laughs> asking your medical provider, because it's just so, so important. The burden really is on families um, on a, in a day-to-day -day way. Definitely. It's, it seems like it's a, it's a family affair, right? Everybody has to understand um, and everybody invests a little bit of time. I'm guessing even siblings sometimes, you know, so thank you. That, that was such a great point as well. Um, I guess this ties into our uh, next question, which is, are there emotional impacts when living with eczema? Sure. So we've kind of addressed some of this daily burden and the decision making and, and some of the uncertainty that families might feel um, when they're making those decisions. That's definitely something that we hear about a lot. Um, but there's also an impact um, from the appearance of eczema at times. So what I sometimes am working with with young kids is just kind of managing um, the emotions that they have about looking a little bit different than their peers and even having to navigate how do they respond to peers who are asking what may seem like just very harmless questions. So um, I'm thinking right now what comes to mind is a patient who is in early elementary school who is just saying like, I'm just really tired of everybody asking me about this. Like, I'm not bothered by my eczema. I know what to do, but I'm just really tired of them asking this. And so one of the things that we worked on clinically was, okay, when someone says something, what do we do? Like, do we have like a standard response that we kind of practice and how do we kind of deflect some of that? Or maybe say, you know, thank you. I hear your question, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. Or we came up with some answers about, well, some people have blue eyes, some have brown, some people have eczema, some people don't. Like we kind of think about where the kids are developmentally to help them navigate that um, because that can be really hard, just getting, getting those questions from some really well-intentioned kids. And then sometimes, unfortunately, some kids who maybe aren't as well-intentioned who just pick up on differences between kids and, and point that out. Um, and some patients, they, they end up, because of the severity of their eczema, 
um, needing to get treatment during the day. So having to like excuse themselves, maybe go to the nurse or to go get lotion, things like that can also draw out a bit of difference. So that's something that I hear from patients. And then I hear that from caregivers as well. Like, well, what do I do when my child comes home telling me this? So we, that's, that's a really big domain um, that we work on. Thank you. That is such a great point. Um, I, that is often a focus of my work with a lot of children and patients, uh, adolescent patients as well. And, you know, sometimes, especially as kids get older and they're kind of thinking through what they want people to know about eczema, a lot of the teen patients will say, I want them to know and understand but I'm also fearful that when I say it's eczema, they'll be like, okay, not a big deal and minimize the impact mm -hmm. again. So I think there's this sense of wanting to be understood, but wanting also people to understand the burden. And you know what Dr. Herbert alluded to is a lot of those questions kids might get, even when they're well, like well-intentioned and they're just curiosity. And you know, caregivers see that too. I can't tell you how many times parents will say they're in the line at the supermarket and some, you know, maybe well-intentioned, but you know, misplaced. Maybe um, mm -hmm. um, helping someone will say, oh, you know, you have to try this or have you taken your child to the doctor? And so for parents, it can be really hard to to handle those questions and then also think about how are they going to model responses for their child? It can be really easy to get angry or say it's none of your business, but they, we also want to model for kids that it's nothing to be ashamed of, that it's nothing wrong and giving, you know, simple information when that in fact makes sense. I love yeah. that. I've, I've heard about the supermarket questions too, Dr. <laughs> Lebovitz. Like families are like, do they think that we're not actually taking our child to the doctor? Like we also see that <laughs> they have some concerns and, and it can get really frustrating to have to say repeatedly like, thank you, but we are doing this. <laughs> and parents struggle too um, with the fact that, you know, if we think about it, when kids are itchy and uncomfortable, when they're not sleeping, you know, we see that in their behavior and, and, and in adults, in all of us, if we think about how we are, our coping resources are not that strong, we're tired, it's hard to concentrate, we're more irritable. So parents also will comment a lot on just the parenting experience and how, you know, they really want to help their child to feel better and how helpless they may feel sometimes seeing their child's kind of daily mood and functioning impacted in that way. Yeah, and actually, can I ask you, uh, Dr. Lebovitz, because I know we're in different climates, so <laughs> you're up in Boston and, and I'm in the mid-Atlantic and you know, kids with eczema live all over the country, um, but I've had some patients who have to make choices about what clothing they wear because of their eczema, and it depends on like the different time of year, and even something as simple as, well, can I wear shorts today or not? when they're a six-year-old or a nine-year-old comparing themselves to their peers, like that can be a really big deal. They just want to look like their friends and not be hot if they're running around. And here, like, you know, we have very muggy, very humid summers. And I've, I've had to talk with kids about that. <laughs> That is so true. So I think I see that come out in a couple ways. I see it come out sometimes when um, we intentionally want kids to cover up a bit. Sometimes environmental exposures or things like that might mean covering up is important. And then we also see it when kids might feel self-conscious, even on a hot day when really shorts and a t-shirt would be the thing to wear. I sometimes see kids feeling self-conscious and like they need um, to cover. So that is you know, a very, a very real challenge. And then also sometimes we see even for our teen patients with that sense of wanting to belong and fit in, most people may not think about the fact that, you know, they may not be able to wear the scented lotions or things like that, that their friends can, because that could irritate their skin. And so they have to, you know, make choices in day-to-day -day life um, that others wouldn't consider. We see that sometimes in sports too. Like certainly we want our kids with atopic dermatitis to play sports, to do things that kids normally do. But sometimes there's a lot of work that goes into that and thinking about how do we clean those hockey pads? How do we cool off after the sporting event where we're out in the heat or in the pollen? Um, because 
that we want them to have fun and be active, but it can sometimes wreak havoc on the skin. And then so there's more burden and time really spent thinking about atopic dermatitis. Yeah, I mean, those are all amazing points. And I love Dr. Herbert that you're like, let me ask a follow up question. Because <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm in California, Southern California. It's a very, it's a very different weather, of course, than Boston and, and elsewhere. So I'm so glad we we touched upon all those different things that are, are things that not only maybe some of us who do have experience with atopic dermatitis or someone who has atopic dermatitis, but maybe some of us who never even thought about that. So it seems like from what I hear both of you saying, a lot of your work is not only um, helping families and your patients get comfortable with, you know, um, having eczema, atopic dermatitis and feeling confident in that, right? Of saying like, yes, I do. And there's nothing wrong, but a lot of it is empowering, right? When they do get asked these questions or empowering them around the decisions, the extra steps that they may have to take playing sports or cleaning their gear, as you said, Dr. Lebovich. So um, I love that, that, that both of you touched upon those different things. As a follow-up uh, question on the emotional impacts, uh, we were curious to know, are people with you know, inflammatory skin diseases like eczema more susceptible to mental health issues such as anxiety and depression? Um, and I think we touched upon this a bit, but if you wanna expand, please do so. In what ways do we think eczema can affect someone's you know, self-esteem or mental health overall? So we do know actually that the mental health burden of atopic dermatitis is significant and it's often unrecognized. So patients with atopic dermatitis, we often think about comorbidities like food allergy or allergic rhinitis or asthma, but in fact, mental health conditions are also um, an important comorbidity for providers and families to be thinking about. So patients we've found are at increased risk for depression and anxiety and in childhood also some other conditions like ADHD um, and, and perhaps autism. And there, there, there are many you know, reasons why this might be the case in terms of pathways. And so some of them that have been you know, looked at or being looked at in the literature include certainly the burden of uncontrolled disease. We've talked about you know, the impact on self-esteem, feeling self-conscious about appearance, sometimes hopelessness around a chronic disease when you feel like I, you know, I keep treating it and it's not getting better, the lifestyle changes. Um, also disrupted sleep, as we mentioned, can have a big impact on mood, a concentration, ability to manage stress. Um, we also know that there are some associations between systemic inflammation, which we may see in patients with atopic dermatitis and development of depression and under other mental health conditions. So there may be some underlying um, predisposing factors that affect both of these um, conditions. And, and then on the other side, we know that it's stressful to have AD. And so we know that um, you know, stress can be a trigger of increased itch, which could lead to more scratching, increase, increased inflammation. We know that depression um, might influence somebody's motivation to follow through with skincare. And so this really becomes kind of a challenging cycle. And I think it's like one of those, it's, you know, not the chicken or the egg, it's the chicken and the egg. And what we have to be thinking about is how do we help families um, make sure that they have and can understand and follow a good treatment plan, medical treatment plan, and then also give them coping tools. And that's when we're, I think we're most likely to see, um, you know, it, the best outcomes. That was a beautiful overview, Dr. Lepovich. I, I don't have much to add to that because I think it was such just a wonderful summary. And I, uh, just to kind of highlight what you said about that cycle, I think that's really important. Um, and the fact that you said it's not the chicken or the egg, but really it's an and um, is so true because that's what I, I see with patients too, that they can kind of get in the cycle. And then our job is to figure out how to like reverse that cycle a little bit, how, you know, to engage in like some behavioral activation if you're feeling depressed or relaxation if the itch is really challenging. And, and that's where mental health professionals can be really helpful in like 
figuring out those interactions and how maybe we can disrupt some of that a bit to improve overall quality of life. Thank you. Um, this, you know, it seems like so much of it, as you both mentioned, is in learning those, you know, coping skills, right? Sometimes you're not able to get rid of something, but you're able to cope with it in a different way. And I'm guessing because both of you mostly see children and adolescents, um, they may need a lot of support from their caregivers to actually, you know, practice these coping skills, um, you know, habitually, like on an everyday basis, if needed or whenever needed. So we're curious to know what you feel are some of the emotional challenges that maybe some of these caregivers, usually women, um, may go through while taking care of a child with eczema. Yeah, this is such a good question. And I, I think my response kind of maps onto different developmental stages. So as you said, like we see you know, young children through adolescence. And I'll, and I'll be honest, like the bulk of the kids that I see with eczema are, are a bit younger um, because those are the ones that tend to get referred to, to me. Um, but one of the things we haven't quite touched on is in this really young child phase where parents are just trying to work through cooperation from kids with their, their treatment plan. So if you think about it, Kids might, you know, have, they have eczema flares, they're putting on lotions that might sting a little bit or burn, or maybe they just don't feel like doing it because they're doing it every single day. Just like a kid might not want to take a bath. Like that's a very normal, developmentally appropriate thing. Kids are developing autonomy. They want to have their say and like, you know, force their way. And so what some parents come to us saying is like, I just cannot get my child to cooperate with this. And it's causing like daily 30 to 45 minute say battles at night as we're trying to get to sleep. And if you think about it, if you have that much time that this is happening, it's stressful, it delays sleep even more. Maybe the child's itching during sleep, which is disrupting sleep. So this is another cycle that can occur. Um, so some of the things that we work on with families um, initially in therapy is typical behavior management, right? Like how do we um, use positive reinforcement to get kids to be more engaged with their treatment? How do we give them some choice? Because so much of this can seem like you have no choice. So how is it that we can decide, well, you choose like what's first, right? Like which, which treatment are we using first? Which part of the body do you want mom to do it or dad, or do you want to try to do it? Or, you know, what pajamas are you going to wear tonight that are going to cover up your arms so that you're not itching or having as much impact on your skin? Like, that's, that's a really big piece of it. Um, and then I also, this is again where I'm curious to hear uh, Dr. Lobovich's thoughts, but um, I've had a couple of patients recently who have been on treatment with Dupixin, which is a monthly injection. And that's something that might initially be happening in a clinic, but then the parents are doing it at home. And so that is a whole new dynamic. If you are administering an injection to your child, um, and if your child is scared of medical procedures like that. So some of the other work that I've been doing with families is just on needle phobia and how is it that we incorporate something like this into a routine and similar to the lotions and the baths that they might have to take, how do we give kids choices? How do we provide positive reinforcement for that? Um, so that's like a, a kind of a big piece of the younger age group. Um, and maybe I'll pause there and we can kind of work our way up the developmental spectrum because I'm sure Dr. Lobovich, you have things to say about young kids too. No, this is this is perfect. I loved hearing what you had to say. Um, you covered things so, so well and the importance of that developmental um, framework. So again, I think I'll um, just add a few pieces. Um, you know, similarly to giving choices, we often talk about kind of making it fun for kids if possible. And so, you know, skincare can become this dreaded part of the evening for everyone. And so this can help kids, but it can also help families. So sometimes when I have um, young ones who are kind of reluctant with moisturizer, um, for example, or topical treatments, we we wouldn't have them put on their own topical medications, but with moisturizer, we might do things like have them draw pictures on their skin and then rub it in, or we might have them draw first on mom or dad um, to build a sense of control, or sometimes their wraps might become superhero wraps or things like that, just to make it a bit more fun. And, and then also thinking about even with younger ones, what can be their understanding 
of why they're doing what they're doing. So for example, if there is a child who's not loving that they have to do a bath every night, sometimes I'll talk to kids about the fact, you know, what do you do when you get thirsty? And they'll tell me that they take a drink, maybe a drink of water. And so we'll talk about a drink as a drink for thirsty skin and how they're helping their skin feel better. So it won't be as itchy. So, so even here, we're thinking about, are there ways um, to help kids understand. And as Dr. Herbert said, give them some control and make the whole interaction more positive. Because then um, I think as Dr. Herbert alluded to, what parents can do then is provide praise and positive attention to those things that are going right and the child is, is uh, doing well. Um, and, and just to briefly comment on that piece around some of the treatments, you know, there's new treatments coming out now, which is wonderful. Um, Dupixin is an example of a treatment that, you know, does require injections and these are done at home. I mean, in our particular clinic, they're done at home from the start. So again, um, you know, th thinking about our younger ones, we're, we're thinking about, are there ways we can give some control? Um, are, are there things, are there choices they might have um, around um, a distraction they might want to use. Some families might think about things like numbing creams. Um, we might wanna think about what time in the day would work well, um, pairing it with something fun or reward afterwards. Um, you know, some, some, some kids like to be aware of what's happening. Some would prefer it happen. It doesn't, so that to the extent that we can work through with children, strategies that help them feel more in control. And so families feel like they have a plan when they're starting this. And then as Dr. Herbert said, some kids may have, have or develop a more significant needle phobia and need some increased support. Yeah, I mean, it seems, you know, from everything both of you have added, um, this this could be, you know, as I think you mentioned before, Dr. Herber, a little bit of a, you know, extra task or extra burden sometimes, especially for the caregiver. So it seems like when you give, you know, kind of your care plan, it's not just for your actual patient, but it's also in a way to empower the caregiver of like, this is happening if this happens in a continuous basis, then like life will just seem or the routine will seem easier, um, at least from what I heard both of you say. Is that mm -hmm. correct? And finding yeah. a way for the routine to work to you, what you had uh, just said made me think about the fact that, for example, there's some things we recommend, like we often recommend um, for some of our patients with more severe disease, if they're flaring to do things like wet wraps at night. Well, for some families, that's just not feasible at night. The kids don't love sleeping in them. There's not a lot of time. So we may work with families around what works for you. If it's easier to do a bath in the middle of the day, it's, if it's easier to have the child wear the wraps for a couple of hours or or even, you know, 20 minutes while they're watching a favorite program or something like that. And obviously these are decisions in our clinic we're making together as a team. So we're working with the healthcare provider um, to make sure they're on board with whatever that plan is, but trying to think out of the box based on what's going to work for that particular family, which of course means they need to be involved in that conversation and building that plan. Yeah, and then as we get older, we can build on exactly what Dr. Obovich said, which is start to involve kids more in those decisions, right? So initially, parents are the ones doing most of this. Kids can understand a bit, but as they get older, they can understand more. So asking them, what are their thoughts and opinions on this type of management? How maybe can we shift a little bit of this um, to them so that the parent isn't the one that is making all those decisions for them? Um, and I think as we kind of move up the, that developmental ladder, that's when we start in like elementary school to get some of those social questions. And so I think for caregivers, a lot of what we had talked about before is coming up at this point of like, well, how do I help my child navigate social situations where someone might ask them about difference? Someone might ask them what's going on, um, where maybe they're a little bit limited in some of the physical activity or the clothing or, or things that they're doing. Um, and so this is when I hear parents worrying on behalf of their kids, I would say, like they're worried about what their child's emotional response might be, or their emotional experiences might be. Um, so there the conversation can shift a lot more to this kind of role play situation or working with the school to find ways for difference to be less noticeable, perhaps. So I had a patient who just had 
um, like a little free pass. And anytime she needed to go to the nurse, she was able to do that. And that respected her desire for privacy as well, because when she was younger, she didn't really mind too much if somebody saw that she was putting on moisturizer. But as she got older, she really didn't want people to see that. So she had permission to just go to the nurse when she needed to do what she needed to do and then come back. So that's the type of kind of new thing that gets navigated as they get older. That, that, that is a great point. Um, just thinking about wherever the child is, how are they going to be able to engage in skincare or acknowledging occasionally they're not? Um, and, um, you know, I'm thinking about the older ones who are going on sleepover overs or things like that. Again, we don't want kids to not be able to participate in these things. They're sometimes a little require a little bit more planning. And that's where as kids get older, as Dr. Herbert, we're saying we're involving them more in the decisions, but helping caregivers sort of anticipate that where the child might need more help is thinking through in advance of things that might come up and kind of problem solving together, thinking about how they're going to come up with a plan. So again, you are gradually giving more of that decision making to the child or the adolescent, but you're often helping often having to help them organize that along the way. And you know, that, that makes me think of another piece that comes along with this commonly is the piece that um, parents of adolescents in particular are going to have to accept that things may not be done quite perfectly or up to how they would do them at first. But the kids that we think do best are the ones where they're able to gradually take on more of an independent role in skincare, but parents are still there for support, for periodic check-ins, for some monitoring. So they're not out there on their own, but they're given a little bit of leeway to kind of to, to work through it and then feel more confident themselves because ultimately we want them to be able to feel like they can be in charge of their own skincare plans. Definitely. Well, speaking of adolescents, um, I know Dr. Herbert, you mentioned that, you know, um, you mainly work with young children, but maybe um, in previous experiences or from colleagues, maybe this is something that you both can uh, help us answer and is how are relationships affected when dealing with eczema, specifically for older teens or young adults? How do you advise people to deal with stress and or anxiety when thinking about dating, intimacy, and sexual relationships? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. And it's one that comes up for anyone that has a chronic illness, right? So you're figuring out how to navigate. And a lot of it a lot of it comes down to disclosure, right? So how is it that you decide when and how you talk about things? And for kids with, or for adolescents with eczema, that might come up earlier than it would for something that isn't as visible. Um, so again, we kind of practice with them, like how would you talk about this? What is it that you want someone to know? How far in advance, like do you want all of this to be coming up? Um, and encouraging kids to think that, you know, the same qualities that they might be looking for in a partner that make them a good partner in other ways of like respecting your, you know, your wishes and your needs and listening to you and, and, you know, caring about you. Like those are things that are really going to promote a healthy relationship if you have eczema as well, because a partner that cares about you is going to understand like, oh, they have a flare right now. Maybe they need to take more time to like put on moisturizer. Maybe they're not going to want to do this activity if they're outside and getting really sweaty because that might affect their eczema. Um, so it's really encouraging kids to think about healthy partners, I think, in many ways for them. Um, and that's that's always a really good, good starting place. Um, and this is where we also can focus on like more of this advocacy piece too. So I'll, I use this fun strategy that's called the DEER strategy, where we kind of have this acronym where you can you know, describe your situation, provide your emotions, ask for something and then reinforce it. And that is a nice way to say like, if this situation comes up, here's what I would like you to do. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, this is a good question indeed. I don't have a lot to add to that response. I think it, it that's exactly what it's about. It's about thinking about, you know, how are you going to disclose? How are you going to get the support 
you need from the relationships that you're in and a lot and sometimes we'll kind of talk about you know even if something like um, a more intimate relationship or dating relationship is something that's new for the patient they may have had previous experiences where they went through something similar with a friend for example where they are thinking about you know um, have often patients will tell me they've had an experience where their close friends who know about their eczema it, they're there to be supportive so if they're not feeling well, they're support, but otherwise it's really, that's not what the relationship is about. That's not what the, the, they, they have fun together. Um, they, um, the eczema isn't the primary focus. So once people know they can be supportive, but it doesn't have to be as much as a big deal, so to speak. Um, and, it's, and certainly in the case of more intimate relationships, there is that piece. We do know that Dr. Herbert and I, you know, work primarily with children, but, you know, the research tells us that even among, you know, adult patients that we see a significant impact on relationships. And sometimes it can affect um, people's sexual lives and intimacy and sexual desire. So these are things that are very, you know, very real and thinking about how people feel about themselves. But the first step is feeling about how do you get the support that you need from your, from your partner? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess we are all very curious to know what are some coping skills that you have found that are most effective for your patients? Well, I, I, I can start with, um, if we're thinking about coping skills, one of the things that I think is really important is having strategies to help manage itch, because that's going to come up all the time for, for patients with eczema. And so one of the big things, and I think this goes for patients, it goes for caregivers, um, is we find that people are often, they are aware that itch can, that scratching can make things worse. And so we hear a lot of don't scratch. And that is really hard because the itch is really intense and scratching relieves that itch. Not only does it relieve the itch, but when we when patients scratch, it actually activates reward centers in their brain. So it's not only relief, it's pleasurable. It's very hard to stop. And so we often work on thinking about not so much language around, um, you know, don't scratch, but more like language around with families. You know, it looks like you're feeling itchy. Uh, what can we do to help, to help it feel better? And because this can be another source of like shame that impacts self-esteem for kids is they feel like they're doing something wrong, but yet they're just itchy and uncomfortable. And so I like to think with, with kids and with families around not what can't you do, but what can you do? And again, we're coming back to being able to reinforce behaviors we want to see. So that might be initially doing something that soothes the skin for that particular patient. It might be, you know, a cool compress or a cool shower or putting on some moisturizer. Um, it might be finding something that keeps their hands busy if they tend to be scratching in situations where they're not even aware that it's happening. So fidget toys or, you know, making bracelets or coloring, you know, depending on the age of the child. Um, video games are great, even though we don't want kids playing them all the time. They're great for distraction. So thinking about um, distractions that people can use. And then certainly some of the strategies that we use a lot as psychologists, um, when we think about itch, strategies like relaxation or guided imagery can be great, both in managing stress in general, but also helping cope with some of that itch can kind of help turn down some of that itch, itch response, um, whether that's during the day or at night. So I'll often work with patients on building those skills so that they can eventually be something that they can draw on when they are feeling itchy. Yeah, I, I am doing a lot of that as well, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lubovitz. And I think maybe I would, um, to the itch part, I, I would add that sometimes kids and adults, like you just don't know you're doing it because it becomes a bit of a habit, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so sometimes I'll have to even just start a little bit before you get to the point of like, how are we problem solving? What are we doing? And raise awareness of itching. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be done in a very non-pejorative, like very subtle way. And an example of that is um, I, had a, I had an elementary school age patient who really wasn't aware that she was itching a lot at school. And we practiced learning some progressive muscle relaxation techniques. And one of them 
is where you pretend you're holding lemons and like you're squeezing them really hard and then you're dropping them. And she said that she felt comfortable having a friend help her remember and notice her itching. So they developed this little code where they just said lemon squeeze. And if her friend in her classroom saw that she was itching, she would say, lemon squeeze, like really quiet. And then my patient would do a little bit of those lemon squeezes. And, and that, that was enough to just kind of bring some of that awareness. So again, this is like a very gentle way to do it. Much like Dr. Lubovitch said, this is not to discipline a child. It is not to say that they are bad, that they're doing something wrong, because there is just this really compelling urge to itch. Um, but it's to kindly raise awareness and, and redirect, much like you might redirect a child if they're doing something else that maybe they're not aware that they're doing, like, you know, chewing their nails or like picking their hair. Like there are these types of habits that, that we just don't know we're doing and can use some assistance, figuring it out, and redirecting. Um, so that's a big piece of it. And then just relaxation skills in general, I think are really helpful with this, this set of, of patients anyway. Sometimes they're having a hard time falling asleep. So giving them skills to use to help them fall asleep um, can be useful. Um, but anytime you're feeling anxious or down or stressed, like using some of those strategies as well as some more like advanced cognitive behavioral strategies can be nice as well. So identifying, you know, what are the common thoughts that I'm having about my eczema, about myself? Are they true? Can we be a detective and figure them out? Are we making predictions about how people are going to respond when we don't actually know if that's true at all, that they're going to respond in a certain way? So as kids get older and can be more aware of those thoughts and feelings that they're having too, we can give them strategies to use when they realize that they're coming up. And, and frequently we teach all this to parents as well so that they can be modeling and, and helping their kids in the moment. It seems that so much of it is uh, raising awareness. And I love the positive lens that you both talk about, right? In terms of what can you do? Let's raise awareness. And also building in that community, right? Just like your patient, Dr. Herber, of her friend um, or their friend helping them. So I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask if there's anything else from the questions that we spoke about that maybe you wanted to add on to, or that you were like, oh, I miss, you know, saying that. And I really wanted to, you know, say this point or bring this point home. I think I would just add in that there are some patients who really benefit from 504 plans within a school setting. So um, kids that have really severe eczema, they may need to have some plans put in place to help them with their eczema management during the day. So like permission, as I said, to like leave the classroom or go to the nurse if they need to. Um, or some of our kids with really severe eczema are hospitalized sometimes and may be missing a bit of school. So just kind of having an acknowledgement from the school that, that um, there may just be a little bit of extra accommodation that's that's needed for some some of these things is important and not every child needs a 504 plan but um, just being aware as a parent that that is something that you are able to um, move forward with if you're in a public school setting is really nice and you said it's a 504 plan like the numbers 504 yeah. so it's it's like an other health impaired aspect of like an individualized education plan so Many of my parents or my families don't have these, but a couple of them have really benefited from that. I, I would absolutely ag agree with that point. So considering whether to implement a 504 plan or definitely, even if you don't have one, collaborating with the school so you feel like the child has what they need to be able to participate during the day. Um, I, the one piece I would add, I think would just be um, going back to that piece around sleep disruption um, for parents of young ones in particular, um, just normalizing that, you know, we see a lot of sleep disruptions. We see sometimes difficulty falling asleep. We see nighttime awakenings. We see a lot of scratching in the sleep. So, so you know, um, we hear commonly, you know, kids, parent, kids will wake up and there's blood on their sheets. And so it's pretty normal that just during our normal transition between sleep cycles, that scratching is enough to wake kids up. So a lot of families will feel like it's like living with a newborn where the child is up constantly. And so 
A lot of families will come in and report that they are co-sleeping and may feel badly about that. And so I always want families to know, don't feel badly. You are doing what you need to do to help your child get some sleep for you to get some sleep. And also as the skin starts to get under better control, you know, we also want to be thinking about in psychologists or other members of the healthcare team can help think about how do we promote good health, uh, help uh, sleep hygiene, and how do we work with families if they're then stuck in a pattern where maybe the child never learned those skills and needs to work and you're working on now transitioning to them their own bed or falling asleep on their own. That's another piece where I think that falls into um, some of the psychosocial impact of atopic dermatitis in a way that, um, you know, a mental health provider might be able to provide some support. Thank you both for adding uh, two very important points that I think would be so incredibly helpful to all of our families um, and children, you know, who are living with atopic dermatitis. <laughs>